Hey there, I am Danielle Fontenot and I have an amazing teaching for you today. I encourage you to get your Bible, get your notebook, get a pen, and let's get ready to study the Word of God together. There are two passages of Scripture I find are the most misunderstood, if you will, by believers today. And one is the book of Job. Stay tuned. I will do a study on Job very soon. And the other one is Paul's thorn in the flesh. So today I want to talk to you about Paul's thorn in the flesh. We're going to go scripture by scripture. I'm not going to give my opinion. I'm not going to be biased. We're going to look at the Word of God. The Word of God speaks for itself. And when you study the Word of God, it renews your mind and it helps us to live in victory. We're already in victory. The devil's already defeated. But you know what? God works through knowledge. And what you don't know will kill you. I know in the um, in the natural, in the world, people have those bumper stickers, you know, what you don't know won't kill you. Well, actually, in the kingdom of God, what you don't know will kill you because the devil wants to deceive you. He has three plans for your life, to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus came to give life and life abundantly. And we, de- we need to know what is the abundant life. We need to know how to release our faith. And of course, that's by quoting scriptures, meditating on the word of God, and putting our faith into action. Anyway, all that to say, we are going to study Paul's thorn in the flesh because we want to help you. I want to see people living in the victory that was already provided for. The devil's defeated. He just doesn't want you to know that you're in victory. And that's why the attacks come and the storms of life come. But you can stand your ground when you know the Word of God. And you might say, well, is it important we study Paul's thorn in the flesh today? Absolutely. Because lots of people believe that lots of people, lots of maybe denominations or ministers or Christians are just repeating something they were heard or it was mistaught, that Paul's thorn in the flesh um, was sickness given to him and he asked to be healed of it and God told him no. And that's not correct. And if you don't properly understand scripture, especially this part of scripture in 2 Corinthians, um, it's going to cause you to have a weak doctrine in the area of divine healing. And if the doctor would give you a diagnosis of something very serious, and you believe along the lines of what I just said, that Paul was sick and God didn't heal him, it's going to be very hard for you yourself to have faith and to um, receive that healing. And so we need to look at the scripture. So again, I encourage you, get your Bible out, highlight, take notes in your Bible. If that Bible is too precious and you can't, then get another Bible. (laughs) You want to take notes. You want to highlight and study the Word of God. So I'm going to answer five questions concerning Paul's thorn in the flesh. Number one, where did Paul's thorn in the flesh come from? Number two, why was Paul given a thorn in the flesh? Number three, what was the purpose of the thorn in the flesh? What Paul's thorn in the flesh was not, that's number four. And number five, what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. This is going to be really, um, really interesting study. I taught it at my church on Wednesday night and it was, it was great. Studying the word of God is always wonderful. Uh, Because of proper interpretation of Scripture, we can clearly identify what his thorn in the flesh was and was not. So you're going to follow along with me in your Bible. We're going to go directly to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 6 to 10. I have the New Living Translation. Um, There's many translations out there, and they're pretty much all going to say the same thing. They might use some words a little different, but that's okay because we're going to study in the original Greek also. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. If I wanted to boast, I would be no fool in doing so, because I would be telling the truth. But I won't do it because I don't want anyone to give me credit beyond what they can see in my life or hear in my message, even though I received such wonderful revelations from God. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Three different times I begged the Lord to take it away. Each time, he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Again, no passage of scripture is so mistaught, so misused, so misunderstood as this passage passage of scripture that talks about Paul's thorn in the flesh. You know, if you really believe that Paul was given a sickness and he was not healed, 
then um, you're going to say, well, if Paul wasn't healed, then how can I expect God to heal me? Because surely I'm not this super apostle doing all this amazing stuff, right? wrote uh, one third, over one third of the New Testament. So if God didn't heal him, then God's not going to heal me. It's going to completely mess up your doctrine in the area of divine healing. This scripture has been used, misused by Christians and ministers. And a lot of times it's out of ignorance. Um, sometimes it's because people don't understand maybe divine healing and they didn't get a breakthrough in an area. And I mean, I'm saying this was with, with such love and gentleness. I don't say this to judge or condemn anyone. And then they take their situation and they elevate it above what God said. And a lot of times it's because they were not taught properly by their denomination or by their minister how to appropriate God's word in the area of healing. Or they were taught that God doesn't always heal, which would be a complete contradiction to 1 Peter 2.24, by Jesus' stripes we were healed. Matthew 8, 17, Jesus took our infirmities and carried our diseases. It's already been done. And so because ministers or a denomination doesn't understand how to receive this divine he healing, how to bring it into the natural, and healing is spiritual. And we bring it over from the spiritual realm into the nat natural realm by the bridge called faith. Anyway, um, you can go back and listen to my teachings on seven things you should know about divine healing, and I'll explain a lot of this. But because they don't see in the natural things line up, they change the Word of God. Well, look at Paul. Well, you know, God doesn't always heal. I remember going through sickness in the year of 2012, and it carried on to 2013, and I was in Cambodia. And I remember during that time when I was believing for healing, knowing that I see Jesus healed everyone. I didn't fully understand divine healing yet. What am I missing? God, you call me to do this. This isn't lining up. I always rejected sickness. I never took it as God trying to teach me and make me humble. That's not, sickness is from the devil. And so I remember the Lord, the Holy Spirit spoke to me several times in my spirit during that season. Don't look at other people's situations and circumstances. Look to my word because when I was believing for healing, the devil would put thoughts in my mind of these wonderful men and women of God who I saw serving in our home church who had a certain diagnosis and I didn't see them walking in healing. I didn't hear them talking about believing for healing. And he would put that, well, look at them. Look what all they're doing for God and they're not healed. And the Holy Spirit, thank God for the Holy Spirit. I remember he spoke that to me. Don't look at other people's situations and circumstances, but look to my word. And many times Christians will, without even realizing it, I believe a lot of times it's out of ignorance. They will elevate a situation or a circumstance and sort of change the word of God without, if you told them they were doing that, they would be like, no, I'm not doing that. I would never do that. But that's what they're doing. When they use that phrase, God doesn't always heal. They're, they're changing the word of God out of ignorance most of the time. Some ministers are just totally against healing and they're like, that's of the devil. And they're just religious spirit manifesting, a Pharisee spirit manifesting. But um, it's really important that we understand that Paul, um, what he went through and what does it mean? And this is going to encourage you greatly, greatly encourage you. So number one, where did Paul's thorn in the flesh come from? We're gonna go right back to scripture. I'm probably gonna sound a little redundant, and I'm just going to repeat a lot, but I'm really wanting to um, drive it home with you, if, if you will. Um, I don't want it to be a mental revelation. I want it to be in your spirit. And again, if you were taught opposite what I'm going to teach, which I'm going to teach the Word of God, if you were taught something else, that mind is working. And as humans, the way our brains are wired, what we first hear and believe, everything else we measure against it. And so we need to get our, our mind renewed. What does the Bible say? So just right now, Father, whoever's watching this, that they would have an open heart and an open mind and that you would speak to them, Holy Spirit, through the scripture, that it would speak and renew their mind so that they can fully understand divine healing and walk in it in Jesus' name. So 2 Corinthians 12, 7, where did Paul's thorn in the flesh come from? Even though I've received such wonderful revelations from God, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, underline this part, a messenger from Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. So Paul clearly tells us and gives us testimony as to where the thorn in the flesh came from. It was given to him from Satan. It was a messenger from Satan. It was not God. I'm going to break down some Greek words from the original text. The Bible, as you know, most of you know, was not originally written in English. Sometimes I wish it was because then we wouldn't have to worry about these things where things were translated and not clearly explained to us. Look, if you study the word, if you're reading your Bible 
and you come across like this passage of scripture in 2 Corinthians and you think this doesn't add up because I know the Bible says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, forever. He healed everyone who came to him. He's still the healer. He hasn't changed, but this doesn't add up. That's where you need to stop and get a good like date study Bible. You need to study it or I pray you have a pastor who is <laughs> who studies the word of God and can speak truth into your life. If not, go ahead and send us a message or an email and we can help you. So when you get, you need to stop and think, this doesn't really add up. Let me just study it. So in the Greek, when you look at some words in the Greek, um, of course the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, not the Hebrew language. You, if you go to Israel today, um, it's a different Hebrew language. The Hebrew that was written um, in the Bible in the Old Testament is a dead language, so that was studied and translated. Then the New Testament was written in Greek and Aramaic. Even the Greek that it was written in in the New Testament is not the same language if you went to Greece today. Again, it was studied and translated, and because of that, sometimes we miss the meat or what it's really trying to say. Um, so the New Testament is prim primarily written in Greek or Aramaic, but the word messenger, I was sent a messenger from Satan. The word messenger, from the original Greek, it's the word angelos. It always referred to a person or a demonic spirit or a fallen angel. But never did it refer to sickness or disease. Never. <laughs> never. I know that's messing with somebody's religious mind right now or an unrenewed mind right now, but never did it refer to sickness or disease. It was someone sent like an assassin. Someone or something sent by Satan to hinder Paul's ministry. If it was sent from God, the apostle Paul would have said it was a messenger sent from God, but it was not. It was a messenger sent from Satan. And I know you might probably have some, probably have some questions right there. Just hold on. I'm going to explain. So where did Paul's thorn in the flesh come from? It was from Satan, not from God. It was something demonic. All right, that's question number one. Number two, why was Paul given a thorn in the flesh? Let's go right back to script, Scripture, seven, 2 Corinthians 12, 7. Underline this. So to keep me from becoming proud, so to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Underline that. He said it twice. The Apostle Paul had such an incredible ministry. He was turning the world upside down. His ministry uh, was growing at a rapid rate, and it needed to because they were killing Christians. They were murdering, murdering Christians. And you know what? We're in America, and our persecution is very mild compared to if you lived in Iran, North Korea, or China. And so his ministry, it grew. It was, he had profound spiritual revelations. He saw things he couldn't even utter. And the Lord handpicked him. Some of the revelations he, he didn't speak about. His mess, message and ministry grew and grew at such a rapid rate that it made the powers of hell and the devil nervous. So of course there was an attack on his life. Paul was a super apostle. He was doing more than anyone else around him was. And Satan recognized this and put Paul on a hit list, if you will. He wanted to oppose him and ultimately destroy him and his ministry. He wanted to thwart the gospel. Listen, when you step out to do something for God, don't be surprised if an attack comes, but you just stand your ground knowing the devil's defeated. The whole point of the attack is to get you to back up. You start believing for healing and it seems like the symptoms get worse. I've heard that countless times with Dodie Osteen, another lady, she was on, I just heard it again. She was on um, Norval Hayes' video and same thing. She was sick from lupus and cerebral palsy and she was blind and she was dying. And the moment she started believing for her healing, the symptoms got worse. The devil wants you to back up. The moment maybe you're praying for that child that's not saved or that husband or wife, it seems they act crazier. The devil wants you to throw up your hands and say, I quit, I tried it, it doesn't work. Don't back up. Stand your ground, just like the apostle Paul did. He had to stand his ground through all this um, opposition. Because Paul had no moral flaw, Satan couldn't use anything like that against him. So he sent a messenger to buffet him and torment him, trying to eliminate him and stop the progress of his ministry. I'm going to read a little bit from my notes because there's so much information here. I don't want to miss it. Let's take a look at the word thorn in Greek. So we just looked at the word messenger, which is angelos. Does not mean sickness or disease. It was something demonic. And then the word thorn in Greek is the word scallops. It is a word used to describe a dangerously sharp, 
tool, not like a thorn from a rose bush or a splinter. In fact, when he used it then, it probably meant um, one of the translations is like a big stake in the ground, and if they would behead someone, they would stick their head on that stake, and they would display it so people would think, I need to obey the laws here because they're going to do this to me. It would freak people out and scare them. It's very graphic when he would use that word, a thorn in the flesh. They didn't think of like a little rose bush splinter. Um, Satan wanted Paul's head on a stake. He wanted to end Paul's life. He wanted to eradicate Paul and his ministry and the message. Again, the devil has three plans for your life, to steal, kill, and destroy. <laughs> so that's number two. Why was Paul given the thorn in the flesh? It was to keep him from becoming proud. If you are running for your life, everywhere you go there's opposition, someone's wanting to kill you, even though you are exceeding everyone else. Your ministry is growing more than everyone else. They didn't say he was proud. It just kept him from becoming proud. I tell you, you're going to be praying and seeking the Lord. You don't have time to be prideful. And so it was sent from Satan, a thorn in the flesh, not sickness or disease. What was the purpose of the thorn in the flesh? Paul told us twice already. Let's look at it again. We're going to go piece by piece to get a proper conclusion. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 again. So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given, my papers are stuck together, bear with me, a thorn in my flesh, a messenger from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. It kept him from becoming conceited because all the amazing revelations. Anyone could easily become conceited whenever you are so quickly promoted. Not saying you will. And don't fear becoming um, successful, if you will, for the Lord because you, you don't want success because you don't. It's, that doesn't mean it's going to happen. But this kept him from becoming conceited. Paul referred to it twice. He knew the purpose was coming out of this attack, this thorn in the flesh. It was assigned against him and his ministry by Satan. I know I said this already, but I'm just really trying to make a point here. It was to keep him from becoming proud. You know, Paul was handpicked by Jesus. He had this powerful encounter on the road to Damascus. Paul was Saul at the time, and he was killing Christians. And Jesus appears to him in this bright light. Paul falls down. He's like, who are you, Lord? And he's like, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. And um, Jesus handpicks him and calls him to have this amazing ministry to spread the gospel and to spread it quickly. Thank God, because again, they were murdering, Christ murdering Christians then. And so um, Paul was set aside for a powerful purpose. Now in Acts 9, 15 through 16, it will talk about Paul's calling. You can go and read that. I'm not going to go into all that, but I'm giving you the reference so you can read it. And yes, he could have become, become conceited. It doesn't say he was, but it was sent. Satan was after him. And it kept him humble. What, number four, what Paul's thorn in the flesh was not. We're going to look at scripture again. Numerous unlettered ministers have asserted their opinions as to what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. The most common given is that Paul suffered from a chronic eye disease, malaria, a hunched back. They name all this stuff, but these are poor theories. Some say he had a speech problem. None of this is proven. All of these are poorly educated theories by unlettered ministers or minist uh, ministries or ministers, denominations. And I'm not being mean. I'm not judging. But they just don't know. They're just repeating what they were told. If you hear anyone trying to teach that Paul's thorn in the flesh was sickness or disease or eye trouble or any other, then you are going to know that individual has not been scholared very well, that they are unlettered. They have not researched like they should have. They twist what Paul said about the thorn in the flesh to establish a non-biblical view on your covenant with God. Your covenant with God is, is healing. It's divine health. It's, um, it's freedom. It's victory. And some attack this kind of message because um, they're just religious and they just don't want to see people well. And some, again, they just do it because they're unlettered. They just don't know better. Through proper interpretation, through Paul's letters and his own testimony, both in text and context, it was never interpreted as sickness or disease. Some inter interpretations will say an infirmity, but in the original language, that doesn't always mean sickness. And I'm going to come back to this. 2 Corinthians 12, let's go to uh, verses 9 to 10. Each time he said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults, hardships, persecutions, and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Regardless of what version of the Bible you're reading from, the word sickness and disease is never mentioned. It's never mentioned. 
The study of the thorn in the flesh, his own words, his own writing, sickness and disease is not mentioned. I know I'm being redundant, but I'm really trying to help you here. The original is translated weakness or infirmity, never translated sickness or disease. In the Bible, the word infirmity translated from the Greek has two meanings. It can mean sickness and disease, or it can mean an inadequacy or lack. And in his context, it's meaning inadequacy or lack. He's never, the messenger was not sickness and disease. The thorn of the flesh was not sickness and disease. His, his weakness was not sickness and disease. It means inadequacy or lack. Listen, where he was weak, God made him strong. I can relate. Years ago when I got saved and God called me to the ministry, I couldn't do these videos. I couldn't public speak. I was so shy. And that was my weakness. That was my inadequacy. I had a lack. But where I've been weak, God has made me strong. His grace has been sufficient. He's given me the boldness, the confidence, the grace I need to get up in front of people and speak. And I even mess up at times. And it's okay. Sometimes I mispronounce something. Sometimes I'm explaining too fast and there's a slip of the tongue and I say something wrong. Sometimes I'm preaching and people are sleeping or look like they don't even believe what you're saying. It's okay. It doesn't move me anymore. Where I'm weak, God has made me strong. Number five, what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. Paul's words by his own testimony makes it absolutely clear. It was a real persistent attack against his life and his ministry. 2 Corinthians 12, 7, again, So to keep me from becoming proud, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger, that word angelos, from Satan to torment me and keep me from becoming proud. Does it say the messenger was sent to make him sick? No, it was sent to torment him or to buffet him. Like a boxing match, when you think of that word buffet, it's repeated blows. It speaks of a continuing and ongoing buffeting. This is what Paul clearly is defining as being struck in his ministry by repeated blows. If you read Paul about Paul, he was stoned. And I don't mean on marijuana. He was stoned with rocks. He was beaten. He went through some hardships. It was buffeting. It was repeated blows. It was not a sickness that Paul took on his body one time and then had to carry for the rest of his life and ministry. It was persecution. An attack and assassination on his life. He had tremendous opposition. Again, go read Paul's letters. They were always faced. I mean, they had, they had to lower him down in a basket one night so he can flee a town because they were going to kill him. He had opposition. The Old Testament, using the same wording for thorn in the flesh, you can find in Numbers 33, verses 55, Joshua 23, 13, and in Judges 2, verse 3. People are described as a thorn in the side. You know, the Philistines were enemies of the Israelites and they were described as a thorn in the flesh. Never sickness or disease. Never. Paul's thorn was a person or group of people or a demonic fallen angel sent by Satan that followed his ministry wherever he went and they stirred up strife. strife. They stirred up persecution. And again, I talked about this. He was stoned, in prison, beaten. A demonic spirit was sent to hinder the work of the gospel, to hinder his ministry. And if you serve Jesus and you preach the real gospel, there will be attacks. He faced incredible opposition. He was opposed by false brethren in the church, and he was constantly opposed by people. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3.12, All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So, we are in this world. We're not of the world, but we're in it. And we are not delivered from wicked, ungodly people and this demonic realm that's here. Jesus promises all these blessings. Those who give up lands and homes, you're going to get this and this. And he says, and persecution. So again, we're not set free from persecution. That's going to happen if you preach the real gospel. Again, here in our nation, I mean, United States, there's a very mild level of it. Other parts of the world, it's extreme. So Paul was persecuted. God didn't say, I'm going to set you free from that. That's why he's like, when I asked God three times, would you take it from me? God was like, my grace is sufficient. You're going to go through it. Look, you're, I'm sorry to tell you, you're going to go through persecution. And so um, people just misunderstand that. And I'm going to say this, Galatians 3.13, the curse of the law is broken. So we have been set free from sin, sickness, and poverty. That was the curse of the law. So that is our covenant that is for us. It's not a promise. It's already been done. But persecution, we have not been set free for. We pray for protection, of course, and God does that. But people are going to hate us. Jesus said, if they hate me, they're going to hate you. So don't get your feelings hurt. And so um, we're just in this world. And it's a wicked world. 
And we're seeing even things change in our nation. And we have to pray for favor with our government and that things don't go the way they're wanting it to go because we will see more persecution. And God's grace will be sufficient for us to go through it. But nowhere in Paul's definition of a thorn in the flesh is sickness or disease the correct interpretation. It was persecution, a messenger sent by Satan to torment and buffet him. Under that persecution, you would stay humble, definitely. Now, Paul does mention in Galatians 4.13, I want to point this out to you. If you go and read, he's writing a letter to the church in Galatia. And he talks about how he came to them in a weakness or a sickness and how he was repulsive to them. And how they would have even taken their own eyes out for him. And that's where Christians are like, oh, he had an eye disease. See, Paul was sick. I'm not saying sickness can't attack your body. But to make the doctrine that Paul was sick and he asked God to heal him and God told him no is completely false. And just because sickness attacks your body, you don't have to keep it either. It's on us. God's given us authority to trample on snakes and scorpions to overcome all the power of the enemy. That's all been provided for. It's not a promise. A promise is something future tense. It's already been provided. Healing is already ours. We got to take it by faith. And again, if you don't understand the statement I just made, go watch my videos on seven things you should know about divine healing. I clearly explain it. And so he does go to the church in Galatia looking pretty rough, but he does recover. And why did he go like that? Well, I think why his eyes looked so bad and they were like, I would have given my own eyes to you. If you go and read in Acts chapter 14, He's in the area of Galatia and he gets beaten. He heals a man and the people want to make him a God. And he's like, no, no, no. And then some men come and stir up the crowd. And next thing you know, from going to want to make him a God, they're wanting to beat him and kill him. And they do. They stone him, I think, to death because it says they dragged him outside the city. His disciples, go read in Acts 14, his disciples surrounded him. He popped up and went back into the city. I think they raised him from the dead. So when he went back into the city, he was in the area of Galatia. He went right back into the city to preach. That's why he looked so bad. Imagine being stones being thrown at your face. I'm sure his eyes were swollen. I'm sure his lip, imagine being in a ring with Mike Tyson. I'm sure he was, they beat the snot out of him. I'm sure there was bleeding and he looked disgusting to them. And he talks to the church at Galatia that you, you know, even the way I looked, you received the message. Who's come and deceived you? Because they were trying to get back under the law. And so I can imagine he's showing up beaten. They probably heard he had just been stoned all for the gospel, all for believing in Jesus. And you could think, well, I don't know if I want to receive that Jesus. Look what they did to you. But they didn't think that way. They received the gospel and he preached to them. And that's his whole point of the letter. You received it and now you're going back on it. What's going on here? And he describes himself as being weak and sick. But again, he had just been stoned. You can read that in Acts 14. And he was in that area of Galatia. But he healed. He recovered so I really hope this teaching has helped you to understand what Paul's thorn in the flesh was and what it was not so you can have a proper understanding in divine healing. Paul didn't ask God to take away sickness and God told him, no, that's so unscriptural. God would be contradicting himself. And so that's why it's important we study the word of God, study it together. If you are a part of a church that doesn't teach like this, then pray about what church God wants you to go to. Because when ministers or Christians teach it the wrong way, like I mentioned, it's going to hinder people and they're not going to have faith for their healing. Too long the church has been going around sick, poor, defeated, and victims. And that was never God's intention. We are to rule and reign in this life with Jesus. We should not be so broken that we can't wait to die and get into the sweet by and by. Yes, there's going to be the storms of life. Yes, sickness might try to attack our body. Yes, people might persecute us. But look, sickness, that's done. Jesus has already done everything he's going to do about sickness. We get it by faith and releasing our faith and believing the word of God. Poverty, that is not God's plan for the believers. I'm not going to get into whole teaching on that, but it's important. We study the word of God so we can live in victory. We're an example to the world around us. Why would they want to follow our Jesus if we're always sick? We're always depressed. We're always ensnared by sin. We are, um, there's no, nothing, nothing supernatural going on in our church. We need to study the Word of God and stick to the Word of God. Don't elevate um, a situation or a circumstance above the Word of God. I pray this teaching has encouraged you and it's causing you to grow and challenging you and getting your mind renewed. Stay tuned for more videos. We love you. God bless. Hey there, I want to thank you so much for watching these videos. If you have been enjoying the content produced here, then I want to encourage you to prayerfully consider supporting this ministry. 
The easiest way to support us is to go to jeremyfontenot.com forward slash give. And there you'll find several ways to give. If you want to give by tithely, tithe.ly, uh, you can find that information, the link on the website. If you want to send it in by mail, make your checks out to Revival Missions and send it in to P.O. Box 546 Jonesboro, Louisiana 71251. Or if you want to give via PayPal, you can do so by going to paypal.me forward slash revival missions. I want to thank you in advance for sowing into this ministry to see the gospel proclaimed. We love you here at Revival Missions.